the, the bottom line is we need to know God, to have that relationship with God. Not play church, not just go through the, let's just do our church thing, uh uh-uh. It'll never be about that. It's we need to know God. We're in 1 John. Finally, finally. After 10 years. No, it wasn't 10 years, but it was close. (laughs) 1 John. So you need a Bible. Absolutely need a Bible. So raise your hand and we'll get you a Bible. Turn to 1 John. Now, I'll do a little bit of introduction here, but we'll get to 1 John. We did a very lengthy introduction to 1 John, which it was shortened by what I, what I really would like to do was just do the whole life of John, which would take about two years. And we didn't do that. We did, I don't know how many messages, but we did, uh, we did a few, but 1 John. Mm-hmm. Father, we love you a lot. Lord, we come away from just a very, very broken world for just a little while, Lord, to, to be still and to remember your faithfulness and your love, to open your word, Lord, and listen for your voice, how we love you. So, Lord, help us, Lord, to follow you. Help us to listen for what you want to say to us individually today through your word. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Thank you for your presence, Lord. You're a good God, and we love you a lot. We trust in you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. All right, just, just to get us back up to speed on this, because you really need to have the backdrop on when John is writing this letter. It's towards the end of his life, uh, and he's an old man, and he's pastoring the church of Ephesus. To get there, he is, he's you know obviously from the land of Israel, you know that, but up there in the area of the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, as you know, and we can spend hours here, and we've done it before, is, uh, is a freshwater lake. It's a lake that's, uh, you know, about seven miles by 14 miles, I think, Bra- uh, I think uh, uh, not Bravanel. What, what's, the, what's the lake up there? I hate getting old. What is it? Jordanel. Jordanel. That's what I was trying to, boy, I don't know how you old people do this. <laughs> Golly, I'm getting messed up. Jordan. I think, think Jordanel is bigger than the, the Sea of Galilee because it's not very big. It's a big freshwater lake. And one of the things that is eye-opening, if you ever get a chance to go to Israel, go. You can't go next time because it's already full. Um, Well, you can buy your way in. Let's talk. But um, (laughs) totally kidding. Don't get weird with me. But the the thing is this, is that really the Sea of Galilee all the way around, it's it's a big freshwater lake. It's it's, it's big, but not that, you know, uh, big. But but really the story of Jesus and John the Apostle and the Apostles really just happened in this area right here. Capernaum, Bethsaida, where he was from. They moved over to, to Capernaum or Capernaum, Chorazin. Remember the curse that the Jesus gave of Chorazin, Magdala. Now this area right here, this area right here between Bethsaida and Capernaum is only about a mile. All right, that's not much more than going over from here to Lowe's and back, you know. That's how far these towns were uh, together. Everyone would have known everyone. In fact, when you go to Israel, again, I love this as one of my happy places at all, all the places we've ever been. I love this around the Sea of Galilee. But when you're out on a boat and you're looking back at the shoreline of where Capernaum is and Bethsaida and those places, now you're looking at Capernaum is like right in here. You're looking at, here's the, the Mount of Beatitudes here. But you look at this, this area right here is where most of the story from the Galilee area took place with Jesus. It's interesting to look at the boat and you go, look at this little section right here, which is about a mile between this, between this area and then back over here. It's only about a mile. And you, you see this. That's where most of the story takes place in your Bible. That's where, the, where John met Jesus, was there on the Sea of Galilee. Of course, as a fisherman there, as, many, as several of the disciples were, uh, him and uh, you know, James and John, the fishermen, James and John, you know, John and James, these two, what, what was their nickname? Their nickname was what? Remember? Sons of, you know that, sons of thunder. The first bikers in the Bible, right? They had the camels that were chopped and all that, you know, sons of thunder. It's because of, uh, it's because of something that happened when they were going through Samaria without telling the whole story. And Capernaum, um, not Capernaum, going through Samaria, going through Samaria, 
uh, is, is where the Samaritans are and the Jews don't have anything to do with the Samaritans and so there's a big rival against them. When Jesus was going through there with the disciples, they were saying, hey, you guys need to go around. You guys don't come through here. And it was James and John that said, Jesus, I like these guys. Jesus, do you want us to call fire down from heaven? Do you know who's with us? Samaritans, you know who's with us? He's, he's God. He will, so we'll walk across on your ashes. You know, let us call fire down from heaven and consume them. I like these guys a lot. All right. So, but you remember what Jesus said without just leaving that hanging? He says, you don't even know what spirit you're of. You know, that's not the spirit of God. That's not the heart of God. Well, the sons of thunder, James and John, uh, well, as they were following Jesus, it was all in this area. It was all in the area down uh, uh, Bethlehem and Jerusalem down this area, all the way up to Caesarea Philippi, and they had gone over to Tyre and Sidon in this area. But if you go from here to here, this is only about 100 miles. That's the entire ministry of Jesus, which is right from here to Windover. Take that section right there. That's the entire life and ministry of Jesus took place in that geographical area right there, mostly up here in the, up in the Galilee area and then down around Jerusalem. Right? So that's where that took place. Now, when Jesus, when Jesus died and rose again from the dead and the church began in Acts chapter 2, and then the persecution began. It began, by, it began in earnest a few chapters in the book of Acts. And it wasn't into Acts chapter 9 did the leader of that group that was coming against the Christians got saved, Saul of Tarsus. When Saul was going after the church, the church began to scatter. And, and they began to go. Now, the disciples stayed in Jerusalem for a season, but then they also began to scatter. And when, when, the, when the, the persecution came, it was Herod Antipas that actually, you know, name dropping here. You, you ought to Google some of these names and kind of get the history of how this works. But it was Herod Antipas that actually started the heavy-duty persecution in that area after Saul of Tarsus had hit it. And, uh, and with that, John left that area and went up to, up to Ephesus. Ephesus. Ephesus is an area now that, uh, that had a lot of good Christians, must have had, because it was a place that, that Paul the Apostle kept gravitating back towards. It's a place that he spent more time there than any other place. He spent over three years there, recorded, probably more, but recorded in our Bible, over three years in Ephesus. Right? So something was going on there. John made his way there. This is important for our study, by the way, so stay with me. Uh, John made his way there to pastor the church that was there. Right? And so you have this church that's there. The interesting thing, a little side note here, is that when John was there, uh, he brought Mary, the mother of Jesus, with him. Remember from the cross, Jesus said, take care of my mother. Remember that? And he was talking to John. And so John did that. According to church history, uh, we know that, that Mary went with John to Ephesus. There's even a place commemorates where, she, where her grave was. Uh, as well as John's. But so, 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 you know, we know that back in the 1800s when they're starting to do more excavations there because tourism starting to pick up, they found a cave that was there just on the outskirts of, of, of Ephesus and they found these drawings that was there, these paint, they're not paintings, they're like frescoes that was there. And you have Mary and you have uh, uh, the apostle uh, Paul there, all right, doing the peace sign, Okay. What up, dog? All right, so <laughs> I'll talk about that in a second. But here you have, what's interesting about this cave, now it had been sealed off from the early church and it had just been abandoned. Nobody, nobody had really gone in there. It was really just kind of abandoned. And then found when it was discovered, it's cool because you don't have any of the, you have graffiti that's in there or writing in there from early Bible times, from early church Bible times, uh, not necessarily just through the ages. And one of the lines in there, it, ha it says that this cave is where John brought Mary. Okay, during the persecution years, and we'll talk about that later on uh, when, we, when we get to, we'll do a little bit of the book of Revelation coming up in the days to come, but, but uh, to what happened to John. But the thing is this, is that she, he brought her to this cave. I like this about, about Paul. I like this about Paul because it's the only image that we have that dates from this early, early days of the church, and you have this. And it goes along with a writing that we have of the early days of the church. There's a writing that, that in, the, in the writing it's saying, uh, a person's asking a guy, how will I know the Apostle Paul when I see him? 
and he, sat, and he gives a little description of him. He says he's a guy with balding head, with one eyebrow, with a hooked nose. He's, he's slumped over, and he has a really high-pitched voice. That's nothing like I was thinking of the Apostle Paul. I think the Apostle Paul, man, he's a man's man. No, he's like, I'm the Apostle Paul. No, he's all hunched over going, I'm the Apostle Paul. You know, it's like weird. It's like, wow, wow. And so when they discovered this, you can see some of the images that was, was this description having him. Okay, let me, this right here, you'll see this. You'll see this sign. Home. Okay, you'll see this sign right here in, in some of the, the early paintings and all that. All it really is, and it depends on who's, you know, defining what it is. It's the, it's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the three in one. Okay, and then you have the New Testament, Old Testament. Okay, you'll also have some say it's the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and the two natures of Jesus, fully man, fully God, is the two. All right, so you have those two definitions of it. It's definitely speaking of the Trinity because that's a big part of the early church trying to define that. And then it's either New Testament, Old Testament, or the two natures of, of Jesus. But that's kind of interesting. So you see, you'll see that sometimes. What are, what are they doing in the peace sign? Well, that's what they're doing. All right, so with that, this is not our study. I just wanted to say that because it's cool. Um, no, our study is when John, and I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. When John was in Ephesus, he went there. So when he's going to write this, this book we're going to read here, uh, he went there because of uh, the persecution. And he was there, he was hooked into the church and, and uh, was the, you know, the leader of the church, the pastor of the church for a season for, for, for many years. And then the persecution hit heavy and they were rounding up Christians all over. And that's where John got arrested. And, and I'll talk all about this. We'll hit, we'll hit this in detail at the end of, we're going to do 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. We'll talk in de detail about what happened there. But uh, he got arrested and was exiled out to the island of Patmos, right? Out this little, little slave island, okay? Alcatraz of the day. We'll talk, we'll talk about that. I, already, I just showed you a picture of this, right? Okay. I talked about the crack that was there at Ephesus. Oh, yeah. Remember the crack? How many remember the crack? Look at that, okay. You don't remember stuff that's like biblically powerful, but the stupid things I say you remember. Okay, all right, so. It was a good joke, though. All right, so. All right, so he was at Patmos, and then, released from Patmos, he goes back to Ephesus, and then we'll talk later about, uh, about what we know about his death. He died in Ephesus. There's even a place today of where his grave was at, all right, so it's kind of interesting. Why do we need to, to, to know all this? We need to know this because it's there at Ephesus that he's writing this. As Pastor John, Pastor, Pastor John is writing this to the church, he's writing this to the churches and to us today. And, and this is what his concerns are. He's talking about his concerns that he has here. He's worried about false teachers that have gone into the church. And we're going to see this as we go through, and we'll hit this pretty heavy. He'll say in verse, where is it at? In, in uh, verse 19 of chapter 2, he says, Look, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, we would have continued with us. But they went out that they might become plain that they were not of us. They left. They left the church. It just showed that they weren't part of us. If they had been part of us, they had stayed with us. As he keeps talking about this, he says, I write these things to you, verse 26, um, to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. Uh, but as his anointing teaches, you know the anointing of God is on you. The Holy Spirit's on you. And I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about this as we, we'll lock into it in a few weeks. But the Holy Spirit is upon you. You know when things are right and when things are wrong if you're a child of God following Jesus. You know it's not right. You know, and so uh, that's what he's saying. You know, the Holy Spirit's speaking. You know it's wrong. What they were teaching you is wrong. And it's, it's a group of, they're called the Gnostics was there seeping into the church. The, the guys with the secret knowledge. Okay, now these guys with secret knowledge, they're, they're in the church today. You know, we'd kind of tweak it a little bit today and say they're super legalistic. You know, we have, this, we have the knowledge. We're the ones that really know how to do this thing called Christianity. And you don't know because we have secret knowledge in that. Yeah, really? You're a dork. Go away. All right, so 
He even says this, and we're going to hit this, and we'll hit this at length as we go along. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. That's in 1 John 4. So he's going to hit that. He's going to hit that issue of, the, of those getting into the church that are causing problems through false teaching. And he's trying, this is the early days of the church too. Church is just getting started, and all this false teaching is coming in. Let me say this to you, and this, and we'll, again, way ahead of the game here because we'll hit this later on. But let me just say this to you is this, the way to inoculate ourselves against false teaching is to have good teaching, yeah. is to know what the Word of God says. Here's what the devil has done very well in our generation. He's taking the Bible out of the church. We are, and I'm adamant about this. I absolutely believe in verse by verse, line by line, Genesis to Revelation. Here's why. is because as we're going through Genesis to Revelation, if I've got bad doctrine, it's going to be adjusted because I'm going through the Word of God. All the, all the Word of God. When Paul was in Ephesus, went back to Ephesus, he went back there as he's getting ready to go to Jerusalem, eventually be arrested, and then to Rome. He's going there. He's meeting with some pastors in, in, um, that are from Ephesus. As he meets there, he says to them, he says, this is the last time you're going to see my face. This is, by the way, this is in Acts chapter 20. He said, this is the last time you're going to see my face. He says, I've not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Okay, that's important right there. I've not shown it. How do we get the whole counsel of God? It's not through little sermonettes that, that blesses little Christianettes. You know, it's through verse by verse, line by line. I'm out of in that. Now, Christians, we, we become a generation that we, we, we don't necessarily want the whole Bible. You know, all those murders and all those names and all that stuff in the Old Testament. You need to know why it's there. You need to know what's going on. From Genesis to Revelation, all of it. God has given us his word. You know, all of it. From Genesis to Revelation, all of it, we ought to know what the Word of God says. Now, I'm pretty adamant about that. You hang out with our church long enough, and you'll have to hang out for a very long time because I'm slow, but you will get through the entire Word of God. It'll take you 60 years, but you will get through it, all right? Because <laughs> I get on these huge, massive rabbit tails. All right, so, so you see that. So Pastor John, 1 John, he's writing this letter to the church because he's, he's concerned about the false teaching that's come in. He also, doesn't, he, he also doesn't hide why he's writing this letter. He tells them several times, he says, I'm writing this, and we are writing these things so that your joy may be, our joy may be complete. Verse, verse 4, 2, 1, little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, you have an advocate with the Father. Great section right there. Looking forward to going through that with you. In chapter 5, in chapter 5, verse 13, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of, of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have towards him. And he goes on there. I'm saying, this is why I'm writing this to you. Not only concerned about the false teachers, but he wants, it, 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 this is really good. Not only concerned about the false teachers, in order to be inoculated, that's a good word for that, inoculated against the false teachers, you need to know Jesus. You need to know the Word of God. You need to know what it means to, to get forgiveness through, through His blood, through what He did upon that cross. And He does this in this book. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. I've got to get to this. Otherwise, I, I'm absolutely going to get a few words in here from the actual letter. All right. So go over to 1 John 1. He says this. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, which we've touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest that we have seen it, testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifest to us. That which we have seen and we've heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And he goes on there. He starts off very similar that he started off the gospel. He says, that which was from the beginning. In John's gospel, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, in the origin of this story, in the origin, in the beginning of all things, really, but you got to understand what he's doing here, right? So I'm going to pause that for a second. In the beginning, in the bigger picture of things, the bigger picture 
is that God is not bound by time. So God does not have a beginning. But in the beginning, here's the story, right? Hold on to that thought. In Micah 5.2, in the prophecy concerning Jesus, it says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Okay, okay Bethlehem, from you, the Messiah is going to come. It's going to be hundreds of years later, but Messiah is going to come. And this is what the prophecy is. Again, Micah 5, 2. It says, whose going forth are from old and from everlasting. That word everlasting literally means beyond the vanishing point, right? Now, if they wrote that there, we'd go, what does that mean? So instead, the translator just says everlasting, meaning it doesn't have a beginning. Whose beginning, whose going forth doesn't have a beginning, doesn't have a beginning, Okay, and so how does that work? Known to God from eternity, known to God from eternity are all his works. Isaiah 43, no, Isaiah 46 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am the God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Now listen to this. I'm declaring, God speaking, Isaiah 46, declaring the end from the beginning, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times as, they are, as though they are not yet done. What is that saying? It's saying not, there's no time right there. Who saved us and called us with his holy calling, not according to our works, thank you God, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he has given us in Christ Jesus. Now listen to the wording, 2 Timothy 1, 9, before time began. That word right there, again, Paul got this in 2 Timothy, that word right there, it's it's hard to translate. Before time began, NIV, before time existed, New American Standard, uh, from all eternity. The Bible says in in Isaiah 57, uh, for thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. God inhabits eternity. I'm making an important point here. Some of you have been around for a while, so you know where I'm going with this. But when we were in the Revelation study, I really had to really make sure we had this as a foundation, this understanding, is that God is not bound by time. In the very first chapter of Revelation, also also in the last chapter of, of Revelation, it says, God who was and is and is to come. Now, most of us just blow right past that. He was and is and is to come. That's fine. Okay, no, slow it down. He was, he is, he is to come all at the same time. All at the same time. What? He was and is and is to come. In the, in the, in the, in the wording of this thing literally means right now, he was. Right now, he is. Right now, he is to come. Wow. What have you been smoking? All right. So, so, all right. So you got to get, so you got to get the concept of this. This will help you understand the Bible. For, for many of you who come to this church very long, all right, you'll get this. This is, ba- this is basic stuff. Help you understand prophecy, the pre-incarnate uh, times, Jesus walking off the Old Testament into the, into the, in, in, walking off the pages of the New Testament into the Old Testament. It'll help you understand some things when you understand God is not bound by time, all right? He inhabits eternity. He was and is and is to come all at the same time. Now for us, we're on this timeline right now. This is gonna help us understand, by the way, for, again, what his opening line to say in the beginning, all right? It's gonna help us understand that. So we're on this line right here, all right? This for you right now, for me right now, okay? On this here, this is where you're born, and this is where you died. This is your line. You're like the, it's like the little dash right there at the, at the tombstone. You know, you go to a gravesite, you see the date and the date of the little dash. This is your dash right here. That's your dash. You're doing your dash. Do your dash. Do the dash well. Do the dash, do the dash, do the dash, dash, dash. Okay, so do the dash. So you're doing the dash right now. All right, that's you. All right, check this out. God who inhabits eternity. God not bound by time. Okay, was and is and is to come. He's not on this timeline. He will be, hold on to that, but God is outside this timeline. He's outside this timeline. So right now, this will mess with your head, right now, you're being born in God's sight. Right now, you're living this day. Right now, you're already in his presence because God is not bound by time. I can only see through this little window of time right now. Okay, middle-aged fat guy, still extremely good looking, all right? (laughs) But that's where I'm at right now, all right? I've, it's like the parade of my life. I've seen, 
I've seen some of the floats go by. I've seen some of the broken floats and this, some been on fire. I've seen the clowns go by and all that. And that's my life. Right now, I'm right here. Okay, where are you at, where are you at with all of this? So this is as far as God has brought me. I'm in this, I'm in this time domain on my, doing my dash right now. And this is where I'm at right now. I don't know what's the rest of it. I don't know. This may be my last day. Praise the Lord. All right? Please quickly, don't let me linger. All right? And take out a group of people with me because that's, I like going with groups. All right? So, okay, so ooh, you shouldn't even say that. <laughs> the voices in my head are twisted. All right? So, okay. so you have this focus. All right? So you guys remember that. Remember this good Bible stuff. All right? So, so I have not seen what the rest of this thing holds. God is outside of time. So I'm on this line right here. Now you're getting this, right? God is outside this time. God's in the helicopter looking at the parade. He sees the whole thing. He sees the beginning from the end. Was and is and is to come. He would have its eternity. He sees the, the whole thing. All right, back to 1 John. Uh, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes. God that's outside of the time domain, bam, entered the time domain. Entered the time domain in the Bethlehem in a, in a stable, and he entered our time, right? It, okay, which is important because that's the story. God became a man. God stepped out of this eternity, stepped into our time, right? And, and, and got on the timeline. And now Jesus, born in, born in Bethlehem, growing, okay? Lear, lear, is he learning? Mm. Okay, so, so all this, his death, resurrection, okay, and then, then, you know, and he talks about this in John's gospel. He talks about, you know, being with the Father like it was before, you know, in eternity, in this eternity. Back to our text. All right. Which was from the beginning, right? Which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, which we've touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest to us. That which we have seen and we heard, we proclaim also to you. We were there. We saw him. We were there. It's the same kind of idea a page earlier. Uh, you go to Second Peter, Peter's last letter. He says, for we did not follow cleverly... Uh, Cleverly devised myths when we made to known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 16 of chapter 1 of 2 Peter. Uh, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when we received the honor and the glory of the Father, the voice which was born, uh, born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard that voice born from heaven, and we heard on that holy mountain. And what he's saying here is, is we were there. We heard God's voice on the transfiguration he's talking about here in 2 Peter. We were there. We saw him. We heard God's voice. We saw him transfigured. You cannot take that away from us. John's saying that here, and John says we were with him. We were there. We were there. We saw him. He changed our lives. You can say a lot about Christianity or churchianity and all that. Here's one thing you can't take away from us is that God loves me. God forgave me. You know, that one scene, I'm like, I'm going to mess it up. That one scene in The Chosen where they said, where Mary Magdalene says, um, I was one way and now I'm another. And the difference is, and what made that happen was Jesus. That's powerful. I almost cry when I say that, you know. And John is saying that right here. He says, look, I was there. I saw him. You cannot take that away. I was one way, and now I'm this way. And what changed that was Jesus. That's what happened to us as, as, as children of God. It's not about going to church. It's like, I'm going to be a good church person. No, I think, I, man, I'm, I'm opinionated. That's why I'm your pastor, but, but uh, I'm opinionated on some of this stuff. But I think some of the most rotten people on planet Earth are, are, are church people. This should know better. We say we have eternal life. We say we have a relationship with Jesus. We say we are to love one another. All men will know where he is if we love one another. But if you don't believe exactly the way I believe and you don't do it exactly the way I do it and you are not a part of my Jesus club, then you're going to burn in hell forever and ever. 
All right? Now, you can, you can run with that in any direction you want to run with, but I think that Jesus was someone that people were drawn to. I think the crowds that were hurting were, were drawn to him by the thousands. Why? Because he told them, all going to burn in hell if you don't believe exactly what I tell you. Is that it? No, he showed them love, and they wanted to follow him. They wanted to hear him. They wanted to be like him. There's a difference in this. Don't tell me what you are. Show me. Don't tell me how you're a good Christian. You know, tell, you know, you're telling me all about, oh, how you're such a good Christian. Great, great. I see your life. Good Christian. Good, no, no. Show me. Show me. You know, you don't have to show me. Show the world. You know, that was one of the things I was telling our group here last week that I was looking at something in the past I'd written down and some notes that I had, and I, and I had written, written this down. Don't tell them, don't, don't tell them who you are, show them who you are. And I remember when the Lord got that, pounded me with that. I'm always telling people who I am. Oh, I'm Pastor of Calvary Chapel, who cares? You know, I'm Pastor of Calvary Chapel. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, when people ask me, what do you do or any of that? It's like, don't, don't tell them, show them. Show them what Jesus looks like. Show them the love. Lord, help us in this, you know, help us in this. I was there, he says. I saw him, you know, I was there. You cannot take that away from us, praise God. You cannot take that away. So that you too may have fellowship with us, he says. Koinonia, that relationship, that love, that, that family atmosphere, he says. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we are witnesses of these things so that our joy may be complete. It says, we have this fellowship. We have this fellow. We have this coin in the end. We need, the, we need that fellowship together. Man, I tell you what, as I got older and following Jesus, and, and uh, here's what's become way more important in life, is to have some friends going through life together, you know, not wanting to, not wanting to be involved in pettiness or stupid little church stuff fights and stuff. And those things happen. You get older, you get older and you just don't want to deal with that stuff anymore. Cause us, just us Christians, we know how to fight. We know how to pick on one another. We know how to judge one another. Oh, look what she's wearing today. Oh, you know, they must have a problem. How come he's sitting over here and she's sitting over there? They must be having a problem. Did you wish? Let's, let's pray for them. A little gossip. Won't you shut your face and get on your knees and pray for them and actually do that? You don't need to be going around gossiping and telling everybody. Right. Why is it so much in the Bible, uh, especially the New Testament, is talking so much about how we treat one another, the things we're not to do? Why is it all in there? Because he knows we're going to do this stuff. We're going to mess it up. We're, the church is brand new. The church is just getting started. He's writing First John. He's writing First John to deal with some of the false garbage that's getting into the church. You know, you want to read a harsh letter, a sad letter, read 2 Corinthians, you know, as Paul loves these guys and they're attacking him. And it's, it's, you know, I want to say, God, your church was messed up right up front. And he says, yeah, I still love my dysfunctional children. And I say, good, there's hope for me. There's hope for us. God loves his dysfunctional children. Oh, you think you got it all together? You're in the wrong church. Okay. You're delusional anyways. Right. <laughs> I got it all together. I'm almost perfect. Well, good for you. How's the, that meds are really helping you, aren't they? I mean, just saying. <laughs> I, love, I love the Apostle Paul because he'll say things like, the evil that I don't want to do, I always find myself doing. Oh, wretched man am I who can deliver me from the power of this death. You know, and then he talked, keep reading. He talks about that. It's Jesus. He, he focuses it again. Or you see David in there in this psalm, you know, telling himself, you know, soul, rejoice. I will tell my soul. And you can see him talking to himself in the Psalms. Rejoice. And then he says things like this. He says, I looked at, then I looked at, the, I looked at the mountain where my redemption comes from. I looked at the holy hill. I, looked, I went to the temple. I went to, I went to church, that kind of thing. But you can see him talking to himself in, in the Psalms. That's why I like the Psalms. The Psalms is saying, you know, you know, pull out of this. What are you, what are you down? Why, oh, soul, why are you down? You know, rejoice in the Lord. You know, what are you doing? You know, love that. Love that. But here's the thing with, with this beginning of John for us today is this, is this right here. God, God's got you. God knows what's going on. And I can trust him and you can trust him. 
If this, if God is outside time and I'm somewhere here, when God lets heavy stuff happen, and it does, heavy stuff happen, I know that he sees the future, I don't. I know that I can trust him. I know that some, sometimes time is difficult. Things are difficult, but I know, God, you see the future, I don't. I don't. Praise God that back here in my journey in Sacramento, planting churches in Sacramento, you did not tell me right here that you're going to send me right here to Utah, Salt Lake City, because I would have freaked and I went the raw of the way and I'd have wondered why you're punishing me and all of that to go to here. But then when we got close to that, then you told me and I still freaked and I still wondered why you're punishing Allison. It wasn't me. I'm pretty good with God. It must be my wife. She must have done something wrong to get us here. But then, but you know what? He, isn't he a good God? Isn't he a good God to carry us through? And now we're here. Now we're down here, somewhere in here. We're down here. And it's like, this is home. This is family. I'm glad you brought us here, Lord. I'm glad you brought us here. I've liked a lot of people here in Salt Lake and I've liked there's others that, well, they could have moved someplace else. So I've been happy, but um, that's just life. But here's the thing, God is outside that time so we can trust in him, so that we can trust in him. And in that, notice what he says here, that we'd have fellowship together, that we'd have fellowship together, that we would love one another, that we'd help one another, that we'd be a family together. You know, you've heard my story, I've told you this a dozen times, you know, that, that I got to that place where I didn't want to go to church anymore. And I'm a pastor, I didn't want to go to church anymore. I didn't like you guys. I didn't like what I was doing. I didn't like any of it. And it was almost audible on a Sunday morning. I just didn't want to go anymore, you know, and it was almost audible. You don't like the church? No, I don't like the church. You're the pastor. Fix it. You know, it was the Holy Spirit. You're the pastor. Fix it. I said, you're God. Kill a few of them. You know, <laughs> <laughs> if you'll kill, there's nothing that a few carefully planned funerals won't fix our church, you know. <laughs> and so what he does is then he changes our hearts so he changes that anger and foolishness to love. He changes us. Good stuff. So much more here. I missed a few things I'll hit on next time. But here in 1 John, as we begin this book, just understand, here's, here's an old man. You know, he's at the end of his run, all right? And he's, he's pastor in this church. And he's really honing in on the, the bottom line is we need to know God, to have that relationship with God. Not play church, not just go through the, let's just do our church thing, uh-uh. It'll never be about that. It's we need to know God. Have that, have that, I love that word, koinonia, have that koinonia, that fellowship with God. To have koinonia with God or that fellowship with God means there's a personal relationship, means there's love, means there's trust, means there's forgiveness, means, there, means there's a, a deep relationship that's there. Do you have that relationship with God? I pray you do. If you don't work on it right now, right now, don't just be a, I just go to church. I just do my church thing. Don't do that. That's dumb. Go do something else. There's other things you can be doing. It's a beautiful day out there. All right. Um, but if you really want to follow God, follow him. Because that's where the joy is. That's where the joy is. And let's do this together. Let's do this together. All right. We'll, uh, we'll serve God together. We'll grow old together. We'll do this thing together. Anyways. Okay, if you read ahead, it'll be very helpful as we go through this. We will take this verse by verse, and we'll just kind of see what we discover as we go along. And Father, thank you so much for your faithfulness and your love and your mercy. Lord, thank you for this family. Lord, as we learn together, and Lord, as we hold on to some of these great promises, Lord, Lord, you got this. No matter what happens to us, Lord, you have this. You're not bound by time, so you see the future, and we can trust in you in the direction that you're taking us. So we're going to trust in you, Lord. Thank you for this family. Thank you for the things that we're learning together. Lord, I pray, always keep this a safe place for us to come and learn about you. Don't let us hurt each other, Lord. Help us to love each other. And Lord, I pray for that one that's here, Lord, that doesn't know you, Lord, that's really struggling, or that one that's a prodigal that's been away from you for a season, Lord. Lord, just meet him in this place. You're so good to us. If you're not sure where you're at with God or Maybe it's time to come home. This is between you and God. You gotta make your path. And this is your time right now. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Pray that right now between you and God. This is a personal moment, you and God. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Lord, help me to follow you. 
Help me to put my trust in you. And I receive you as Lord and Savior. Lord, thank you. You made it that simple. You're so faithful to us. And if we just say yes to you, Lord, you change everything. We love you, Lord. We love you a lot. Thank you for this family. Again, thank you for the things that we're learning together, Lord. Just doing life together, growing old together in this wonderful family. We love you, Jesus. We love you a lot. Let's all stand together.